Friends, a very warm welcome. Uh, uh, we had a Zoom meeting this morning, that's why uh, uh, the, the upload is a bit late. And we also <laughs> just recorded part of the of, of, of the worship um, meeting together. So sorry for that. We're going to technical stuff that we will sort out. I decided just to record the first bit again so that you can at least hear the sermon and uh, and and watch uh, watch till the end so uh, please enjoy it together we're gonna we're gonna read together from Romans chapter 12 verse uh, verse verse 1 and 2 and you you welcome to uh, following your own translation what I have here is the message translation so um, uh, so uh, follow um, as as we read together let me pray for us and then we will read God's word together Lord, we thank you that you speak, that you are still speaking to us about um, the new life in Christ, but also how to live out that that life as part of a community. And as we endeavor to be cross-culture church, to be cross-centered, cross-bearing, and culture-engaging missionaries to our culture, church community, help us to really be the family of servants on mission that we believe you called us to be and work that in us through your holy and active and living word, help us to hear what you want to say through your spirit to the congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, let's read, read God's word together. Paul writes, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and work, walking around life, And place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you, living then as every one of you does in pure grace. It's important that you not misinterpret yourself as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what He does for us, not by what we are and what we do for Him. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of His body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, We wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be, without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. If you preach, just preach God's message. Nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you put in charge, don't manipulate. If you call to give aid to people in distress, keep your eye upon and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master. Cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they are happy. Shed tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, God says. I'll take care of it. 
Now, Scripture tells us that if you see your enemy hungry, you go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. This is um, God's word. We praise him for it. And let's, um, let's consider, think, think it through um, together. Let me just get this um, slide right again. Um, great. I hope you um, you found that uh, challenging and intriguing. The message uh, Eugene Peterson had a great way of just um, just uh, just putting into words. I think what what is meant in the original text. Um, of course, Romans twelve uh, follows Paul's exhortation is, um, is 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 writing to first and for all, foremost convict us of our sin and brokenness and, and telling us that all fall short of God's glory. And then the wonderful, powerful gospel of, of Jesus Christ, the righteousness that came through him and, and the work of the Spirit. And then you get to this uh, uh, final part of the, the book of Romans where he calls us to um, real personal devotion and conviction. And so I want to start off with that because um, if you listened well, you, you would see and you would hear that that our faith is a personal faith. And Christianity is deeply personal. Um, uh, and I hope Peter has also convinced you of this as, as we studied the book of Peter. We've heard um, hopefully each and every one personally that we, that is you and, and I, are his beloved chosen children. She has strangers in this world, but he has personally chosen you. Work the wonder of regeneration inside of you. Uh, you are born again into his new family, his people, um, his new spiritual temple, where you have a unique place as a living stone. You are a royal priest, personally rescued and brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. You've been personally given the task of proclaiming his excellencies. Now, if your relationship um, with your Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit is not deeply personal. If all these truths that I just men mentioned isn't a deep personal thing for you, uh, the reality that you are now in Jesus and, and, and if this does not stir your heart personally, something is not right. You need to come and chat and we need to um, speak about the gospel more so that you can hear the personal call. The idea that we are somehow okay by association, um, you've grown up in the church or your name is somewhere on a database and you, you do still use communion uh, regularly and you, you, you attend worship services. Um, I mean, all of that is good things, but, but in and of itself, it means nothing. Faith needs to get personal. The problem is that we have an enemy uh, and like he always does, um, he use, uh, misuse a good focus and, and he comes and tweaks and twists it just a little bit to make us think um, differently. So you sort of have it, but, but he skews it just a bit. And, and, and um, uh, with this, I think he's done a, a, a really good job in a sense of leading us astray because what what the enemy came to do is make us think that personal conviction, personal faith, equals a private faith. Um, like I say, it starts with a subtle shift from, from the school to personal devotion, to, to, to a focus of satisfying a need for a personal and private experience of God. Uh, it's a move from, a, from, a, a, from an outward focus, personally taking up my cross for his kingdom's sake to an inward sort of gaze. How does God help and assist me to cope with all my problems and my guilt and my shame and the injustice done to me and the dreams that I have? How does God and his church help me to, to overcome all of this and reach all my goals and become all that I, I want to become and that I deserve to become? So my, my personal salvation for his glory become a private salvation for my personal benefit. In the process, the church becomes an organization that should 
service all of my spiritual needs, the needs of my family, my children, uh, uh, rather than a body that I'm part of by His grace, to be loved, yes, but in such a way that I change into someone who loves well. Um, the church is a space to learn how to sacrifice myself and how to use the gifts for God's, my gifts, all my gifts for God's glory and for His kingdom's sake, together with my fellow believers. Church is not meant to be an organization first and foremost. Organized, yes. But it should be a family of servants on God's mission together. Not, as many people think, an organization of spiritual consumers uh, waiting, resting, wanting to be ministered to. Uh, a church can <laughs> therefore never be something that we go to. Okay? Or nowadays, um, we watch you know, we, we watch church. No, no, we are born into the church. Uh, it, it, it's not an event or a program. It's a new way of life. It's an organism of which I have become a living part in and through Jesus Christ. Now, friends, as leaders of Cross Culture Church, we are really rebelling against this twisted form of church. And, and it's hard because the problem is not out there somewhere. It is in us. It's really in me. We, we've grown up sort of... or. Um, and this, this way of thinking have been growing inside of us. Now, the culture around us is one of consumerism, where it's all about me and my experience and my needs and my problems. And therefore, there's, there's really in society today little commitment. There's little loyalty. I change churches like I do wires or shopping malls or movie theaters. It's really in the air that we breathe. Personally, I, I do not want to pour myself out. I want to have safe church, preaching, um, singing, have people praise and applaud, give them money so that, so that everything can work well. Um, but but I, 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 I don't want people that close, people to see my personal uh, uh, struggles. I, uh, I, I don't really want to let anyone in, okay? And, and if this is our default uh, thinking, even as leaders, um, we cannot let our God down for one minute, or we will be simply going back into that old mold. No, we, we are convinced that we are called to fight the good fight. We, we believe God has given us back the vision He, he has, the, the idea of church that Jesus came to die for. And it's all here in Romans 12. It's, um, it's really an invitation to a whole new way of life. It bids you and me come and die and find that you will truly live. This is the message of the wondrous cross. This is a song we're going to sing at the end. So, uh, what I want to do next, and uh, you might think, oh, long intro, but, but we're halfway through the sermon because I simply want to walk you through this text and, and have you asked, but is Romans 12 saying what I've just said? <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to read it from the ESV. Uh, uh, and, uh, and here, here it starts, um, a, a living sacrifice. That is how the heading in the ESV v is. And, and Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore. Do you hear the, the seriousness of Paul? I appeal to you. The urgency, okay? On what grounds is he appealing to us? And, and what is the appeal? Here it is. By the mercies of God. I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So, so the question is, is, is worship first and foremost an experience on a Sunday for an hour? Not according to the Bible. Worship is at its heart me dying to myself and living to please the God who saved me. It's saying to God, do with me at your, as you please. That is worship. And sure, we can express it in song, but it needs to be expressed in all of our lives. And why? It's because of his great mercy. Um, it, it worship is saying, Lord Jesus, you rescued me. You saved me from sure death. You came to live the life of righteousness that I should have lived and die the death that I, a sinner, deserved. And all I have to do is, is believe it. I have to grab hold of it and in faith live my life in light of it. 
Um, it begins by presenting myself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to, to God through Jesus. And, and, and Paul calls it reasonable. This is the heart of worship. It, it's just reasonable in light of what Jesus has done for me to do this. Um, and so I hope as I speak to you that you've personally done this. That you've said, Lord, here I am. Take my everyday, ordinary life, my sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life as an offering. Uh, I want to please you and serve you in everything I think and do, from brushing my teeth to, to pour uh, a loving work in, in the community to my everything. I want to please you. So yeah, this is not about everyone becoming a pastor or a missionary um, uh, or, or to a far off place. Um, uh, this, uh, this call is not just for some of us super Christians. All of us need to be daily living sacrifices. And so the question is, friends, have you done this? Have, have you gotten to this point? Are you continuously doing this? Because it's also not a once-off thing. It is a daily call to give myself constantly uh, everything I am and have to him. Um, and to do this, we, we, of course, need to think differently. That's verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this word, world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and, um, and perfect. That, that's verse 2. I hope you follow there. Um, so God needs to come and do this in us through the Holy Spirit. He needs to come and renew our thinking because we do not think in terms of this. Thing. Um, and, and he does so. He renews our thinking by hearing over and over again that Jesus had to die because of the seriousness of my sin and my selfishness, but that he wanted to because of the depth of his love for me, and, and that he now calls me into this life where he lives through his spirit in me, and hearing this over and over every Sunday, every Bible study, in my personal devotions, um, uh, helps me to get to know God better and better, and see and understand his way, yeah, his revealed will for how I should live better. And as I go out and obey and come back and confess and repent and praise him and do it over and over again, the promise is that he will renew my mind. And all of this needs to happen personally, but not privately and individually, but as part of his new body of people. You see, God came to break through the division that was between me and him through Christ, but also to break through all of our man-made divisions so we can be united across racial and ethnic and gender and age and class barriers one humanity no room for pride and prejudice and classism and racism and sexism and all the isms okay verse 3 says for by the grace given to me i say to everyone among you do not think of of himself more highly than he ought to think or she ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. The thing is, we're all equal. God give gifts. He chose us. We all saved by grace. We are all important instruments, no matter the different gifting that we bring to the body. But in his hands, we all on equal ground. And so the, the, the call is to humble yourself. And then verse 4, for as in, in, in one body, we, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does uh, acts of mercy with cheerfulness. You see, there's no distinction between these gifts, although you would say, ah, oh, isn't prophecy or preaching or teaching, isn't that more important? No, everything is important. Every one of us is important if we want to be this new humanity, this new body. And friends, I, I, I can't claim to be in Jesus, to have tasted his mercy and not be devoted to a local body where I use my gifts for the benefit of that body. Faith is not private. It's personal, but it's not private. It needs a body. And now Paul goes on in the rest of this passage that we really just going to read through to make this very practical. 
And I, I think it needs no explanation, really, if you read from verse 9 to the end. You can go think how to do it practically, but, but it needs no explanation. It needs, what it needs is a body. It needs uh, fellow believers. It, it needs a, a group of people coming together and saying, we're going to do it because it's impossible to obey on your own. Think with me. Listen. He says, let love be genuine. Not fake love. Genuine love. Abhor what is evil. Hold, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. That means all these strangers that's in Jesus that came together, you must learn how to like them because that's that word, brotherly affection. It's really liking. Outdo one another in showing honor, honoring each other, lifting each other up. Do not be slothful in zeal. Uh, verse 11, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. That's our focus. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Pray, pray, pray. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. We can't do that on our own. What does my fellow believers need? How can I invite them into my plentiful, into, into what I have to share with them, showing true hospitality? Verse 14 says, bear those who persecute you. Uh, uh, bless those who, who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Uh, it's once again this idea of inside of the body. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Look for those outcasts, those people that's really struggling, uh, the downcast, downtrodden people. Associate with them like Jesus did. Never, never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, with all people. We know that the first churches, uh, we read in Acts, the community around them loved them at first. So there, were, there was persecution, but the call is as far as it's up to us. Have peace with the people around, uh, around you. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To, to the contrary, if your em enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's sort of the, the tagline for this, this, this last bit. Um, you see why I say this, this really doesn't need any explanation. I mean, the heading of the ESV uh, translation reads, Marks of the True Christian. Marks of the True Christian. So, uh, but this doesn't mean I need to be perfect in, in this. I can battle with this. I can struggle to fulfill this. Most probably we are going to. I guess this is why Paul needed to write this down. Uh, uh, to live in this way takes effort. It needs to, uh, I need to gauge. I, I need, it takes intentionality. It takes reminding ourselves of the gospel of Jesus, the mercy of God regularly. It takes dying to myself. It takes sacrifice. And, and we won't get it right overnight and probably not get it right 100% this side of heaven. Okay? But it is not optional. It is not for some super Christian somewhere out there. We can't ignore this because it is hard. No, this is how true Christians live. This is how they at least endeavor to live. They want to live this way. They want to create this kind of community. Do you notice that Paul nowhere in this says, he says, this is your reasonable uh, worship. And then he explains, and he nowhere says, to be a true Christian, you need a great worship experience. You, you need, what you need to be a true Christian is great nuggets of truth uh, to go and build your business on uh, um, you, you, some Holy Spirit inspiration to go and make your dreams come true, to, to live the life you've always wanted. That's not what he, he says. No. On the contrary, Romans 12 says a true Christian, and with this we conclude, a true Christian is someone that's overwhelmed by God's mercy in Jesus, saved from death, brought over into new life. And therefore, takes all that he or she is and has and gives it back to God, presenting their, their whole selves, their bodies to God as living sacrifices. Uh, they seek the renewal of their minds. They seek for it to be changed from consumer minds to servant minds through constant engaging in God's word. They humble themselves. 
And they commit their gifts and talents to the body of God, to real people in real time lives, each church. And together with their fellow believers, they learn to love. And they learn to abhor what's evil and hold on to what God says is good. And they honor their fellow men and they serve God with zeal and they rejoice in the hope in Jesus. Jesus coming again and they patiently trust God in difficult times and they pray and pray and pray together and apart and, and they, they don't cease in prayer and they give and they share money and time and possessions and they show hospitality inviting even strangers in and they bless their persecutors and they do life together with fellow believers laughing together weeping together Together they seek out the lowly in society and associate with them. They are humble. They, they're never wise and we have all the answers. They do not repay evil with evil. They try and live in peace with everyone that they come across. They never, never avenge themselves, but they trust God as the ultimate judge to put things right eventually. They serve even their enemies, their persecutors. And they really together as a body overcome evil with good friends imagine just dream with me about a church like that and the question is have you bought into this is this you are you is this at least what you want to be the, this description in romans 12 are, are you are you convinced that you you've been brought into god's army of cross-bearing disciples mm -hmm. Um, is this us cross cross culture church? Um, what I what I can say, friends, is, and I'm speaking once again on behalf of the elders, and I believe all the leaders, and and hopefully all the people that's already committed the members. But this is this is really who we want to be in Jesus's spell. And and we really believe this is not just a pipe dream of an old text. We believe it is possible because of him. All we need to do is to want it, to seek it intentionally. And this is what we want to do together. We cannot be this overnight, but we can seek it and, and grow into this together. And so hear the invitation in him. Hear the invitation. It's, it's an invitation to come and swim upstream with Jesus as a family of servants on his mission. We're going to unpack a lot more of that in weeks to come. But here's where it starts, a deep and personal conviction, yes, but not a private one. Not with myself and my relationship at the center. No, for him and for his glory and for these fellow believers that I've committed myself to. That is what God is calling us to. That is what he's inviting us into anew today. Amen. Friends, let's, let's just take a moment, um, each and every one of us, and just consider this, and, um, and then I will, I will uh, lead us in prayer, and then, Brian, we can, um, we can sing together just that song before... Um, I just share a bit of the practical things before we go go into um, into our breakout breakout rooms. And let's just become quiet, and then I will lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, uh, we are thankful for your, your sacrifice, Father. We are thankful for you taking that sacrifice and applying it to each and everyone who trusts in you so that we can stand before you clean, washed clean, bought back by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we are thankful that you want to make this real to our hearts, make, make it something that we do not just understand intellectually, but really sense personally. And we know you are calling each and every one of us anew to say, yes, Lord, here's all of me. Here's, here's all of me. Here's my whole life, my job, my possessions, my desires, my family, 
my relationships, all of me, it is yours to use. And you tell us how you want to use it. You want to renew our minds. You want to make us humble. You want to take those gifts that you've given us, the talents and the gifts of the spirit and, and apply it to this new creation, this new temple, uh, the body of Jesus, your church. And you want to grow this church into a, a, a vehicle for change in people's lives, real change, real change from consumers to, to being servants. And we want to be part of it. Lord, um, work it in our hearts anew. Help us to grasp the hugeness. Yes, the sacrifice of this, but also... It is a sacrifice that will lead us to life, not death, as we think. Yes, death to ourselves and our own ideas, but, but the life, the real life that you called us to live. Help us um, as we now sing, apply to our hearts, and as we suggest as, as leaders a practical way in which we want to make this tangible in our time. Lead us, lead us in that. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Um, Brian, you can you can lead us in this um, in this last song. Thanks, Lewis.
Friends, I um, want to share with you just what's next, um, just as an overview for our discussions in the breakaway rooms. And so, Erna, you can you can just uh, go to the next slide. So I hope you will, each and every one of you, go and think about the sermon and how to apply it in our context. But 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 here's our outline. Um, so um, so. First and foremost, this is our basic commitments. And so we say, we says, and, and the, we will send these documents, but we, we say at Cross Culture Church, our core identity is beloved cross-bearing children of God and disciples of Jesus. That's who we are. Um, and uh, we said we became uh, these disciples uh, and we, dist uh, we sustain in our disciples by the Holy Spirit through the means of grace. That is the gospel preached and teach in our Bible studies, in pastoral care, one-on-one, -on -one, everywhere, but also the celebrating of the sacraments in, in corporate worship. Um, and, and we believe that as a disciple of Jesus, we are together called and therefore committed to live within a gospel-centered, graceful community where we are intentional about being discipled and discipling each other, and that this is a 24-7 thing. It's not a hour a week or a Bible study a week. It is we are in constant discipleship relationships with each other. And so you can you can move on, Erna. Um, and so this is how we practically just see the spaces where this plays out, uh, where we get together to reflect on our 24-7 discipleship. Big group gatherings, corporate worship, that is what we've done to this morning. Missional community gatherings, we will be speaking about in the next couple of weeks, and especially special now next, that is, that is our, our focus. Big group men's and women fellowship, you're always welcome to those on a Wednesday evening. DNA groups, which I will share a bit more about in future, but which you will also discuss now in the breakaway rooms. And then kids, teens, um, we have that this evening at five um, the CCC kids that's for the um, primary school kids um, also that time uh, a life group and teaching and the toddlers you had a, a, a message that Arna brought to them via via YouTube our main focus is on the missional communities um, uh, uh, that we will um, be speaking about in the breakaway rooms and not just um, the next one and so uh, um, maybe it is a new word. We've been speaking uh, up to this point about life groups. Um, some of you come from traditions where we speak about Bible study groups or small groups. I mean, all, all are valid aspects of um, coming together in smaller units of the congregation where life on life discipleship can really happen. Um, we want to we wanna use the new term, missional communi communities, because it carries across a bit more than just the inward small group or a Bible study idea. And so it is a smaller group of disciples. If you look at the definition there, who forms a gospel community, a family um, that lives out the mission of God together, that is declaring the gospel to others. So we missionaries, we're a family of missionaries uh, in a specific area to a specific, specific group of people by demonstrating the gospel in tangible forms. We are servants. Um, and so the place, the main vehicle for living this 24-7 is within our missional um, communities. And what you are going to walk through um, in the one group with Brian and in the other group here after with me and Chris is a template um, uh, that we, this is a suggestion. It isn't set in stone, but this is what we think about. Um, missional communities must use the gatherings on Sunday morning, the worship service. They must um, uh, uh, have fellowship regularly, and currently our rhythm for the fellowship is after the sermon, uh, after the worship together. And, and it's not Mac fellowship, like Brian said. Um, so that MC is <laughs> uh, missional community. So Sunday morning fellowship, um, 
a family meal nights or mornings together that is a possibility so to have at least two times a month uh, a meal night where someone hosts the group um, fun activity together that is the mission of fun activity and that is just going out and playing games or doing some fun fun activity the next one is the service project together so a very clear of servant, a servant missional focus for um, our missional community, um, our life groups. And then the DNA groups, which is a work in progress, but we hope um, that we can eventually have in each missional community at least one or two men's and or women, women's group of two to three um, men or women that gets together for deep work of the spirit and applying the gospel. And so currently, we believe we, we, we can manage about two communities um, to start off with. And that's why you've, you divide it into to two groups. So we're going we're gonna to be busy with that. Um, uh, and and uh, you can read through that organic life together um, in, in, those, in those smaller groups. Just switch to the next one. I don't know. I'm going to close with this. It's important things to keep in mind. Um, for the conversation you're going to have just now. So to prayerfully consider your involvement and commitment. Um, this is not a project by force, but an invitation. So, um, so see this as a healthy invitation and the needed rhythms of grace into which Jesus is calling you, not as a law that is imposed on you. Keep the goal in mind. If you want to be a disciple, we believe this is Jesus's way. Um, uh, 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 the, 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 a willingness to grow into being part of such missional community uh, is important. So don't say yeah, because I'm this looks like too much, so I'm not. I'm not. I'm out. Rather says, okay, I'm willing to commit to one of these things and hopefully grow into this. Um, on the other hand, I mean, nothing is going to come without clear intention and commitment. So challenge yourself. Also push yourself in terms of your um uh, your uh, commitment and um what we are what we are putting forth is that we as elders uh um endeavor to ask nothing of you guys and the rest of the leaders we we ask nothing that we're not willing to do ourselves um so great with that in mind um listen to god sending us out into these groups um for this further discussion just with his his blessing um Matthew 28, Jesus is speaking and he's standing there on the mountain with his 12 disciples. Um, can you think this small group of people thinking, how are we going to take this further? And Jesus give this blessing and that really, that really turned around history. Um, it really influenced our world in such a big way. We believe the same. God wants to still do the same through us. So listen to this blessing, receive it. Um, from not me, the pastor, but from Jesus Christ. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, all authority. You guys, followers of me, disciples, sold out disciples of me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen.